Hi, Linda. So Hi, we're, Elena. We're here at the Go to Chicago 2013, and it's the first conference that we have in Chicago. Uh -huh. And uh, we're very happy to have you here as a speaker. Thank you. And I just saw the audience, all of them were very happy to hear you talk. Thank you. So. It was not the first time I've given the talk, but it's the second time for that version. So it's a little bit of an experiment. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. when you say experiment, do you think it was really an experiment, like you talked about in your talk, that it's a scientific experiment? Yes, it was, because uh, actually every talk I give is an experiment, because in the beginning I have a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I have something that I believe about mm -hmm. the talk, and it, it, it's strange that you can't know that until you give it in front of an audience. And afterwards, I must immediately react to what happened. Yes. So I made a lot of changes after that talk. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the way all talks are. That, that process never ends. Mm -hmm. And I keep learning, even if I've given essentially a talk many times, I keep changing it based on what I hear from the audience. So it was, yes, it, it was an experience. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Thank you. One of the things I, I really enjoyed was uh, hearing about, you talked about incentives, how to motivate people, and how, how the brain works, and, and my question is about that intrinsic motivation. You talked about intrinsic motivation as opposed to extrinsic motivation, I suppose. And, and I teach teachers how to teach. And we talk about... Sort of meta, meta teacher. Meta, meta teacher. Meta, meta teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and and we talk about motivation a lot because that's a that's a huge problem at universities in Denmark where people get paid to go to university, contrary to other countries. But that's another discussion. Yes. And, and the problem that they have is that the students are not very motivated to do anything. And we talk about intrinsic motivation where you can put some students, you can put them in a cardboard box, and you can take them out five years later, and they've learned all the curriculum. Yes. Others, you you feel that you sit down with them, hold hands with them, and they learn nothing. Well, maybe should we define yes. extrinsic? Yes. Because in the in the beginning, when people talked about incentives, what they meant was some kind of reward, mm -hmm. a carrot, or some kind of punishment, a stick that comes from someone else, and they apply it depending upon the context. If they want you to do something, they reward you for that behavior. If they don't, they punish you for that behavior. And for a long time psychologists and others who study human behavior believe that was it. That that and your biological needs were what determined what you did. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until 1949 with that experiment I talked about with the rhesus monkeys where uh, Harlow discovered that the monkeys were solving puzzles not because they got raisins or because they were sprayed with water if they didn't want them to solve them. But simply on their own because they loved it. They thought it was fun. They got joy from it. And so the idea of intrinsic motivation was born. Nobody paid any attention to it for almost 20 years. They weren't willing to admit that that could be as strong as and maybe a more powerful motivator than all of the carrots and sticks that people had been using for a long time. So the question really is, we know about carrots and sticks, and we know their limitations. And we know that many times it's counterintuitive that you can turn off an interest with an incentive, with a carrot. The data is pretty clear. So what is it that you do to create intrinsic motivation? And my answer is that they have to see it. They model it. So I wondered for a long time why my daughter doesn't like to read. She really has never enjoyed reading. And I thought, I spent so much time reading to her as a child. And she sees me reading. Mm -hmm. Why didn't she pick that up? Yeah. So now she spends a lot of time driving for her job. And she loves listening to books, yeah. to audio books. And as I thought about it, I realized that's what 
I modeled for her was listening. No, because you read aloud. Because I read aloud to her for years and years and years, and we we also did that as a family. Yeah. That that's what I was sort of encouraging her to do. Not reading from a book to pick it up and look at the text, but to listen to somebody read to you because she loves it. I didn't tell her to do that. And I'm so surprised at the variety of books she reads and how much she's always got a book in her car. She never starts out on a trip without a stack of audiobooks. She's got them on her phone now, so it's not really a separate thing she carries along, but she loves it. And I thought, I was modeling, yeah. reading aloud to her. So instead of telling her that she should be listening to audiobooks, you had, yeah. you had given her the, the feeling that it was nice to listen to books being read aloud. So the modeling, yeah. the modeling. There's a study that I talk about all the time now because I just had my 71st birthday. Oh my God! Congratulations! Oh my God. God! And what the study showed is that people who don't believe that old people are worthwhile, they believe old people are incompetent, that they really just need to be in a home, and you know, they certainly couldn't do anything worthwhile. No. That, those people are more likely to behave that way themselves when they get older and to show signs of aging earlier, so heart trouble, strokes. So they live out the expectations. their expectations. And what keeps people from having those expectations is a model. Yeah. They need to see it. Yeah. And so at the end of most of my talks now, I tell everyone about this experiment and I tell them, that I should be their role model. Because here's what 71 is like. 71 travels around the world. 71 and exercises, goes for a long bike ride, enjoys life, has a lot of interest, and gets to hang out with cool people. That's what old age is about. Mm -hmm. So if they can let me be their model for that, then they will be like that when they are 70. It will affect their performance. So that's what we need, our more role. I tell that to women in, in the same way that I can be your model. I did it. I got a PhD in computer science. I'm just really an average person. I'm not a genius. If I can do it, you can do it. Yes. If I can do well in the work environment, you can do well in the working environment. And that's what we need to bring out the passion, the joy for anything, is to see it modeled in someone who really has it. So if teachers love to learn, if teachers love math or science or their subject, they will teach that along with the subject itself. Unfortunately, a lot of teachers don't love. No. That's something they're what they are to teach that. That is true. And so that's what they teach. Yes. They teach the lack of joy for that subject. And that may be a stronger lesson than learning calculus or chemistry if the teacher has lost. Maybe they felt it initially and now it's gone. Lost. That's definitely a killer for teaching. It is. It is. And it's difficult for teachers themselves to maintain that. Yes. And I think the best thing they can do is have support group. Yeah. So they need models as well. Yes. They need to go to workshops where they can be inspired. Yeah. I mean, we've all done that. We've gone to workshops like this amazing conference. Mm -hmm. And you go to a conference and you're there for a couple of days and you come away and you're energized because you remember. Yeah, but unfortunately, ah. when it comes to teaching at university, that's not, at least in Denmark, yet something that you do on a general basis. You go to academic conferences, you have peer reviews on your research, you do not have any peer reviews on your teaching. You can always do something. Yes. You can always do something. And it, so it would begin with a local group. Yeah, grassroots. It would be grassroots, step by step. 
and you can get together with someone else who's maybe feeling the same way. And I mean, there's material on the web, there are inspirational books. You could have a study group where you read uh, an inspirational book together and you could tell each other stories about the good times. Oh yeah, I remember now when I was in love with my subject. And I had a wonderful experience teaching my students and, and then they'll remember and other getting things. good examples of how to teach this particular subject yes. in a way that it's yes. interesting for you and the students. But yes. Yeah, I just I just and the focus on the positive. Yeah. So we always remember the bad things. Yes. And we get so discouraged and we think, oh things are really bad. And so there has to be some point of turnaround. Mm -hmm. And you can hardly do that on your own. It's very difficult. But somehow, in a group, you can bootstrap that each true. other, yeah. and there's nothing that we like more than to help someone else. Yeah. And it's really easy to see yes. others' problems, oh, yeah. so it can be a uh, little therapy session. Yes. And with the idea that we're, we're going to be positive, we're going to focus on the times, and you're going to when help remember, the others. and we're going to help each other, yeah. and bootstrap ourselves, and we're going to recapture that joy. And I think actually that your book about how to introduce change in yeah, a culture see, is really helpful for that. You can certainly use it for that because it's small steps. Yes. And and also the the book at the end of the uh, talk today that I ran out of time before I got to cover talks about the power of small wins. That what makes us happy in our work is not that we discovered the cure for cancer. It's that we are working on something we care about and we're able to make some small progress. That if we just feel at the end of the day that we did something. It's yes. like the dogs, the rescue dogs. They didn't have to find 20 people, just one person at the end of the day. And now they're happy. We're just like those rescue dogs. We need to have just a little Incentive, just a little feeling, a little feeling of success. That we yes. made a difference. Yes. Today I made a difference. I saved one human being. And I think that ties back to how to how to help the students create and intrinsic motivation. If you can give them these small steps, these small feelings of success yes. with the subject, I think yes. that could help. Absolutely. And that, of course, that fits in with another talk that I give a lot now about agile mindset. Yeah that there's a whole movement now in education about realizing that it's not that you have talent and you don't. It's about we all have what we were born with, but we can also all improve. Yes. My husband and I live in a retirement community now and we started a recorder group. We have about a dozen people who are in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, and some of them have never played an instrument in their lives. Don't read music, because they have been told their whole lives, oh, you don't have any musical talent. Your sister did, yeah, yeah. but you don't have it. So you don't get to play the instrument. You can't sing. Nobody would want to hear you sing. Yes. And they've been told that for 60 years. Seven. And that's a prophecy that years. came to become true. And after a while they believed it. Yes. So now they're finding, I may not go to Carnegie Hall, but I can play. And I can enjoy getting together with a dozen other people and we can go to a nursing home and we can play Christmas songs mm -hmm. and make people happy yeah. by our music. And for them, that's a world shattering experience. Why did they have to wait yes. so long? But it's good that they reached it at some point. Yeah, absolutely. The alternative is much worse. Absolutely, absolutely. So that, those two things fit together, yes. I think. The, the modeling of the joy and the realization that we can all get better at anything yeah. if we just are determined and we work hard at it and we practice, we can all get better. And, and learning the joy and accepting being happy about the little steps, the small yes, steps. Yes, small steps. And in fact, that's what, it's called the progress principle. And they studied software developers. And that's what they saw. It didn't have to be some major breakthrough. It was just a small thing. In the same way, small setbacks. So if managers don't remove obstacles, if people throw things in their way, and if day after day they feel like, I'm not getting anywhere, 
I'm stuck. This is just awful. If they go home like that every day, it's actually much worse. It's two to three times worse than if they had that small little step in progress. The negative experiences, they tend to last longer than it was. Yes, there was a, a keynote speaker at the Agile Conference, not last year, but the year before, who's actually measured that. Mm -hmm. And it's so much, the negative effects are so much more powerful, even though they're small. So we need to pay attention to that. Those little things make a huge difference. I think it's interesting to hear your presentations at these development conferences because you're the, the, the things that you're talking about are so much different than the newest languages on the virtual machine or how to use GitHub or something like that. What spurred your curiosity about how, how the brain works? Uh, I think it's probably because I used to be a very technical person. I have a PhD in computer science, but I also have a master's in mathematics and I started on a PhD in mathematics. Um, I began as a chemist, a bachelor's degree in chemistry. And I was never interested in psychology. I had to take one course to graduate along the way somewhere, and I took it. I hated it. And when Mary Lynn Mance and I started writing Fearless Change, and we tried to document what it was that we did to introduce patterns, that's what it was about in the beginning, what we saw is that it wasn't about all the technical, the rational, the logical things no. at all. It was about other things and in trying to understand why, why did it work that way? And why was it so powerful? Why can't you just give a rational argument for why patterns are good and say, all right, let's do it. Why doesn't that work? It doesn't. That is frustrating. It is. It is frustrating. So in looking at what worked, and also having people coach me, because we had a lot of good reviewers who said, well, you should read this, and you should look at that, and seeing that people had experience that showed, yes, those patterns work, because your brain has these funny quirks, and here's how you really listen to things, and here's how you interpret things. So that was mm, 20 years ago. I haven't stopped since. I don't know. It's, we are the most fascinating things on the planet. Definitely. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And I guess the other thing my husband says is that the whole field of psychology, sociology, they are all becoming more technical. They have In more, what way? They can, by technical stuff? They are, and they, and they can measure. You, you can put someone in an MRI machine, mm -hmm. or you can use an EEG, and you can see. Yeah. You can see that when they look at a can of Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. certain parts of their brain light up. So the people who sell Coca-Cola, they're watching. I think that's interesting because you come from something which is metric that you can measure. It's measurable. Yes, that's and right. So and, and then you go into something which is more, you could say, fluffy. But it, it's becoming less. And that's becoming. That's sort of becoming going less fluffy. Sort of becoming yes. Technical. In fact, if you look at the progress that's been made by cognitive science, mm -hmm. the science that studies the brain, and compare that to the progress in software development, they're way ahead. Yeah. They really do experiments. They're really making progress. They do real research. They're not just saying that I did this and it went very well. Right. Not, you should do and it. therefore, you should do it yes. too. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I have more money for marketing. <laughs> but you should use my products. <laughs> so, what keeps you going? Why do you come to these weird talks? Do you think that uh, you're able to find anything useful? Are you changing? Have you become different? Because I have become different. I think that, that my father suffered from a severe brain damage some years ago. And uh, although it was, it was very sad, it was also somewhat interesting to see how brain damage uh, affects the brain. And I started reading a book like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Cat. Yes, yes all of Yes, and I, I thought that was really interesting to see how, but that was more from a physi physiological angle. I was looking at different parts of the brain and how it works. And then I became interested in, in 
And on, in parallel of that, in, in the background for how my teaching worked, I used to have a theory of practice of my teaching. I knew what worked and what didn't work, but I didn't know why. And I started studying the research about learning and teaching. And, and then when I came to one of your presentations about how the brain works and what, what makes us say and do the things that we do and, and what motivates us, I, I begin to find it interesting, uh, both on the level I had with my father's brain, but also on the level of the students. And I, I thought it all tied neatly together. Yeah. There's a wonderful book called My Stroke of Insight. Yeah. It's about a neuroscientist yes. who had a stroke. And she documented what That's was happening fantastic. to her as it was happening. That's oh, I can feel I must be it must be on my left yes. side, so now I'm losing feeling on my yeah. right side. And she was so objective and so yes. scientific about the things that were happening to her and in her struggles to recover. And now that's what she talks about yes. all the time is that experience and what she really learned from going through that herself. So certainly when we go through those things or others who are close to us go through those things, it's a little bit of a wake up call. It is. It becomes, it becomes, um, well, very visual how important the brain is for our yes. whole body, for our feelings, for our personality, yes. and, and yes. how much the, the skill set, in a sense, or the talents, doesn't really matter if the brain doesn't help you, yes. and if you don't help the brain. Yes. There's so many interesting case studies, if you get caught up in that, mm -hmm. of amazing people who have had problems. There was even a, a movie called Memento. Yeah was made about someone who had damage to the hippocampus. If you have a damaged hippocampus, you cannot learn. You can remember what happened before the incident, the accident, the illness, but you can't lay down any new information after that. And it was an amazing movie. It was run backwards. Sort of gave you the feeling about how the world is for him now and what a tragic experience he had been through. But you really feel it. Yeah. The movie was so well done that it really makes you feel how a brain that came from and how that might be the worst possible thing. Yes. You can't imagine. When it comes I to brains, learn. I think sometimes, I often think that must be the worst possible thing. I think so happen. too. Then I read something new and <laughs> that must be the worst possible thing that could happen. Because what, uh, what I'm terrified of, of course, is Alzheimer's. Yes. As people get older, the statistics are not good. That uh, almost everyone who's 90 or above has some sign of it. But what's encouraging is that there are things you can do. And as long as you're out there and if you have purpose, yes. I talked about that today, purpose is a strong component. When they ask people to look back on their lives, those who felt a sense of purpose correlates pretty strongly with those who do not have Alzheimer's. So a sense of purpose, being involved, being active, uh, wrestling with complex problems, doing all kinds of things, that, that gives you a, a sort of an army of resistance against a whole host of things. And that would be true at any age. I worry sometimes about some of the software developers I talk to who are bored. Mm -hmm. They feel like they do the same things all the time. Yes. They feel like they're not learning. Yeah. They say you're opening yourself up to get into a bad place. Yeah. It's up to you, just like you have to exercise your body. You have to keep your brain in shape as well. So there's a, a lesson even for very young people. Even for kids. That's even for kids, absolutely. Yeah. Keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> we also need sleep. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, we also uh, need sleep. That's a that was a, a, a long time. Let's see. Liz talked about that today. Yes. Six hours. So what we know is the global average hours per night is decreasing. Yes. And so it's not just a problem in Western Europe or the U.S. that everyone doesn't appreciate that that's where learning takes place. If you don't sleep, you don't learn. If you don't sleep, your hippocampus shrinks. If you don't sleep, then after a while, things are really bad for your body. So it's not just um, elective time, it's essential.
It's not just in the short run, but you think, oh, I'm going to be sleepy tomorrow. I can make up for it. Yes. I can make up for it. No, I can sleep on the weekend. I can sleep yeah. on the plane. And we don't. And in fact, that making up is worse. It's sort of like a diet. I can lose yeah. 10 pounds today, yeah. and then tomorrow you gain 20. So that up and down kind of behavior is not good for our uh, physical health or our mental health. We need to have regular hours. And I mean, we are still the people who walked around the savanna tens of thousands of years ago. We have not really. No. And so when we get too far away from things that are the way we were, we don't do as well. And sleep, we used to sleep 10 hours a night. 